So the next few Sundays, I don't know how long it will take, we are going to have sessions on mastering pranayam. What you're seeing actually is a preview of my forthcoming book on pranayam. And um, it's called Mastering Pranayam, the seven-step program. I'm not too sure whether I want to call it fire and breath or breath and fire. Kind of sounds like um, interesting, but um, I'm open to suggestions if anybody has any bright ideas. The book is divided into two parts, basic and advanced. And um, just because it says at once does not mean that, um, you know, that you cannot participate in those sessions. Um, the basic begins with certain ideas that most people actually skip. Most people like to jump to the advanced parts. And when they do that, the jumping over or skipping over the basic part and they go to the advanced part and they keep doing stuff but find out somehow that um, things don't seem to be working out and they wonder why. The reason they don't work out is because you've skipped the basic. So in the next few sessions we are going to cover some basic things where it's theory as well as certain practices and, um, and before we go on to the advanced. I just want to mention here that we are going to be approaching prana, pranayam, breathing, breathing exercises, this entire thing from the point of view of the Samaya tradition. As you are well aware, there are many, many traditions, there are many, many teachers, everybody has their own way of doing things, even within our tradition, different teachers approach things differently. I am doing this from the point of Samaya. Samaya means the internal path and Samaya means I am with you. These are very simple practices and lead to direct experience if done systematically, gradually over a period of time. Of course, most of you are coming from different traditions, different teachers, and have gone through different experiences in life. And um, sometimes when we go through these sessions, you might wonder why you did certain things and, and why I'm saying something else. We can discuss some of these issues. If I can give you an answer and explain it, well, I'm good. Sometimes... Um, these things are difficult to, to explain and if it is difficult to explain then we just leave it at that just so that you have an understanding that the Samaya tradition being an internal tradition being a very fine tradition is often not understood most people begin with external practices and very often complicated practices. They regard the simple practices as too easy or simplistic. In fact, the opposite is true. Less is more. Similarly, simple is always better. The simpler the practices, the deeper you can go with it. The way I have set up the book and this, these online sessions is that we will go through it systematically, step by step and build it up. So it may happen that if you have a certain question, I might defer the question to another session because it may not be possible to explain that immediately because we need to build it up over, you know, build up the understanding. It's like saying, uh, you know, you want to know calculus and you want to know higher mathematics, but you can't just jump to higher mathematics. You need to first learn 
basics, numbers, you know, simple addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. So certain things we need to go through before we can explain the more subtler details. Okay. So any questions so far? Probably not. <laughs> Just wanted to mention to all those who came in a little later that since we are having increasing number of people joining in over a period of time, I have noticed that some people tend to have technical issues and uh, send me messages during the meeting and of course I cannot attend to these issues. So uh, Joachim is the moderator and if you have any issues technical or related to organization you can write him a message. So we start with the very first uh, aspect and that's prana and yoga meditation. Why do we do pranayam? What is the connection between thoughts and breath? And the connection between breath and lifespan? Understanding this connection is important. It makes you understand why pranayam is probably the most important, single most important aspect in meditation as a preparation for higher states of meditation. Some of you uh, have already seen or are familiar with our uh, favorite diagram, which is a diagram, I call it the diagram of the universe. And in this you see the center of consciousness, you see the active, latent and active unconscious mind. You see the conscious mind, you see breath, and you see the body and senses. So when you think about the connection between breath and mind, you're at this spot here. When you start your meditation, most of the time, you need to work at the physical level and also with your senses. But eventually, you come to one of the most important aspects, which is the breath. The breath is a bridge to the mind. It's the bridge between the body and the mind. So at the level of breath, we use the breath to understand our mind initially, the state of our mind. The breath reveals the state of your mind. Observing the breath means, in a way, observing the conscious mind. The inverse is also true. And that means that if you are able to study your conscious mind and calm it down, you will calm down your breath as well. Or the breath can be used as a handle and you calm down your breath, you calm down your conscious mind. So you see they both have a relationship both ways. Both of them are relating to each other. It's not just a one-way relationship, it's both ways. And most of us do not know our mind. And we are therefore not able to control our breath. Those who know the mind, those who know the mind are able to control the breath, which explains that yogis have been known to control the breath in such a manner they can enter the breathless state. When we start, naturally we cannot enter the breathless state immediately because first we need to start with purely observing the breath and understanding the breath. And by understanding the breath, eventually we learn to use the breath as a handle to slowly gain mastery over the conscious mind. When I mean mastery, I don't mean control in the sense 
of controlling the way we understand controlling as in you know to manipulate mastery means becoming an observer becoming a witness witnessing the conscious mind most of the time we don't witness it we fall into whatever thought is rising up in the conscious mind we get attached to that thought we go up or down with the thought if it is a attachment we get attached to it if it is an aversion we get disgusted with it so observing the breath means learning to observe the mind and this is the connection between breath and mind and mind and breath in the beginning as i said we start using the breath as a handle for the conscious mind and eventually as we gain mastery we learn to controlling the mind also control our breath so both are true the second aspect uh, radhika ji yes ashish what about things like uh, exercise like running because the breath becomes faster mm-hmm. when you're running yes but the mind is not agitated in that state you think so Well, it's it's a rhythmic kind of breathing, although it's faster than normal breathing. Hmm. From a yogic perspective, um, running, if if it is rhythmic, it may be okay. But imagine you are running away from something and exerting a lot of you know uh, effort into it. At that point of time, it may not be rhythmic anymore, and then. you may see the effect of the on the mind better but uh, running in general from a purely yogic perspective does not have the same benefits on the mind as obviously breath has running has physical benefits and in fact has a lot of aspects which are not necessarily positive as well i don't want to go into the details of running because we are talking about pranayam but um, running no, i just wanted to the connection between faster breathing and the effect impact on having an agitated mind yes i am coming to that because okay. the next part was breath and life span so we come to the aspect of breath and life span and we observe the yogi says your life span depends on breath when you come to this plane your life span is predetermined from a yogic perspective due to your kam- karma samskaras in previous lives the life span of this lifetime has been predetermined so you ask what is my life span how long am i going to live how many years well years does not have any significance time is purely a artificial construct created by people time in terms of clocks etc in the astrological sense time would be seasons and revolutions round round the sun but from a yogic perspective time is connected to breath so your life span is your breath and when i say or when the yogis say that your life span has been predetermined it means you have a certain number of breaths if you breathe fast you're going to use up those breaths faster if you breathe slowly and rhythmically you will use up those breaths over a longer period of time time as in this artificial construct that we call time If you study animals, yogis study animals. They have observed something interesting in animals. Dogs have a rapid breath. Comes to your question, Ashish. Dogs have, over a period of time, a very rapid breath. You will see that dogs who are panting, you know, have a rapid breath mostly. They will breathe. uh over over 20 breaths per minute they have a very short very short life span you know the breath uh, the life span of a dog is 
around 10 years, 10 to maximum like around 15 years, that would be considered very long for a dog. Elephants breathe much slower, have a much more calmer, longer breath. And elephants are known to live up to 100 years. Which animal is known to live very long? Tortoise, I guess. Yes. Tortoise lives up to 400 years, breathes very slow, very slow breath, very slow, even breath. So an agitated breath creates a subtle impression also in the mind, but also has an impact on the lifespan. Now the yogis have their exercise as well. According to in yoga, you have aerobic as well as anaerobic exercise. So there are certain practices which are aerobic in nature. That means they increase the circulation, you know, they pump up the entire circulatory system. So certain exercises, yogic exercises are done, including pranayam exercises, which will churn up your entire pranic system circulation. And the others are anaerobic, that means they calm down the system. So these are, from a yogic perspective, handled in a very different way from running, which is why I don't want to go too deep into running, except to say running does agitate the mind, only we don't see that as agitation, because we do not have that kind of subtle yogic understanding of the mind. As the mind, as our understanding of the subtler states increases, then you will understand what is meant by it. Definitely the mind of an athlete or of a professional runner is very different from that of a yogi or somebody who is practicing breathing exercises, which may be also like Bhastrika and Kapal Bhati may be faster, but they are not agitating. They have a different purpose. Okay? So when okay. we speak of an agitated mind, yes, it's an unrhythmic breathing. It's a over a period of time, it becomes a chronic, fast, shallow breathing, which causes permanent state of stress in the body. And normally, as I said, the relationship is inverse. So it's very often a state of mind which is under permanent stress, which causes rapid breathing, agitated breathing, shallow breathing. There's an inver inverse relationship. No, it's a two-way relationship. It's not just one way. And observing the breath, we can observe our minds. We can observe our thoughts and eventually over a period of time we would learn also to master our breath because we learn mastery of the mind. We get a deeper understanding of lifespan through, through this as well. So anybody would like to ask? Anything here before we continue to the next uh, topic? The next topic is the dangers of incorrect breathing exercises. The reason I have written incorrect breathing exercises here that's breathing exercises and the reason for this is when we start what we call pranayam we are not actually practicing pranayam at all what you are doing is breathing exercises and that we can understand once again through this preview here that the breathing exercises are done at this point here Sorry. Um. Okay. 
So the breathing exercises are done here at this point. And prana is done at this point here. So when we start, we are practicing breathing exercises and not pranayama. When we are clear about that, we can also understand the dangers in practicing incorrect breathing exercises. So what are the dangers? This is uh, from the website, that first, and um, there are quite a few uh, articles on pranayam, so those who are interested can also have a look at it eventually. And we say that well, there are some serious dangers involved in doing pranayam practices without a trained teacher. It has become fashionable for people to do what they call advanced pranayam, and you have a lot of courses and seminars and workshops on advanced pranayam, and they teach you things, you know, kumbhak practices, holding breath, and um, some very complicated exercises which, which mostly even the so-called teachers don't understand. When they're teaching them, they need a book to read out those uh, practices. So many of these teachers are actually just uh, experimenting on, on their students. But the dangers that are created due to that are not explained to the students. It disturbs the pranic vehicle. Incorrect breathing exercises can disturb the pranic vehicle. Wrong practices can lead to many imbalances. Some of the signs are headaches, frequent headaches. They could be erratic mood changes. You may experience depression. You may have a tendency to cause and congestion. You may experience, instead of energy, you may experience tiredness. Or one of the clear signs is dizziness. When you do some sort of breathing exercises and then you start experiencing dizziness. And a prolonged practice of incorrect pranayama over a period of time can lead to very serious and permanent disturbance or imbalance of the nervous system. And the fact is that when that happens, no one can help you. There is only one practice actually which is safe to do without any guidance and that is diaphragmatic breathing. So anybody and everybody can do diaphragmatic breathing. So what are some of the precautions that you need to take care of? It should not be done out of books, websites, and videos. Having said that, of course, I have put these practices on my website. But I always have a warning right on top that these are meant actually for those who are in the mentoring program who are being guided by me personally. And um, during the course of these uh, online sessions, we will go through some of these things. You can ask your questions. We'll clarify doubts. But of course, it's always better to do these um, if you've been asked to do by a trained teacher and with guidance and not putting together practices yourself. I say some people cut and paste practices, take practices from different websites, different traditions, different teachers and put together something that they call my practice. And what it is, is basically um, something one has just put together, you know, and most of the time that which is put together, and I've seen this repeatedly again and again by people who come to me, and they have been into many traditions over years and many teachers, and when they come to me, and they explain to me what they have been doing. It's very sad because many, many years have gone in experimentation and much of that uh, experimentation has been counterproductive, has not helped, but rather has, has uh, and I've seen it, has damaged it to pranic level. And that has to be then unlearned. And that unlearning process can take years. And sometimes that damage 
cannot be even undone. At least I do not know of any means to undo some of that damage. This practice should be only undertaken with uh, highly experienced qualified teachers of an unbroken lineage and ancient tradition. And I have specified that for the simple reason that there are many teachers who go to different um, teachers training courses, etc. And then they claim to be qualified, but they're not necessarily qualified because many of these teachers training programs themselves are just been put together by people who have read a lot of different books. So if you have a choice, um, you know, you say, I don't know any qualified teachers. I, I don't know, uh, you know, any traditions. Then I would even say, go so far as to say, then don't. Then don't practice prana and breathing exercises. The only thing that you can safely do is diaphragmatic breathing. Do diaphragmatic breathing and that's okay. But avoid teachers that mix practices from different traditions. So... If you do not find a qualified teacher, experienced teacher, better to abstain from these practices. Even in our tradition, including, yes, somebody wanted are to... You, are you including two, two to one breathing as diaphragmatic breathing? Uh, sorry, can you repeat your question? Are you including uh, two to one breathing as diaphragmatic breathing? No, no. To do two to one, uh, rechak is not diaphragmatic breathing. Though diaphragmatic breathing is used in it, but what I mean here by diaphragmatic breathing is learning to, over a period of time, breathe diaphragmatic uh, from using the diaphragm and make that your normal breathing pattern. Most of us do not breathe using the diaphragm. We have very shallow chest breathing. In the next sessions, we will have a look at what exactly diaphragmatic breathing is. And so there are two or three simple practices that strengthen diaphragmatic breathing. And that's what I'm suggesting, that one does only these if you do not have access to a qualified teacher or experienced teacher who knows what he or she is talking about. And Rechak, what you mentioned, two to one breathing, is practiced later when diaphragmatic breathing has been mastered. Mastered in the sense that your normal, regular breathing is diaphragmatic. So I just wanted to show you a short video. Um, It's uh, one of the very popular videos from Swami Rama, and I hope everyone can see it. I will tell you about Bhut Shuddhi in Laya Yoga. The writer writes, let, your, let the earth be dissolved in the water, let water be dissolved in the fire, and let fire be dissolved in the air, and let air be dissolved in the sky. What have you understood? Nothing. And suppose you practice that my body is dissolving, <laughs> and it is becoming water, and my water is, that water is being dissolved by the fire, you will find a problem which cannot be cured by any medicine. Bad yoga practice can lead you to very dangerous situations for which there is no medicine. Suppose your pranic vehicles are disturbed because of your foolish practices that you have read through books. Where is the medicine for that? Therefore, a teacher is needed. And teachers should be skilled enough not to mislead their students, not to make experiments on them. 
Let teacher make experiments on himself, on themselves. So, we have always on the scriptures warning. Yellow mark on the scriptures. Don't do it. It's a tradition. I will never, that's why I do not touch too much Kumbhaka. Because you do not eat right food, you lead very hectic life, you don't watch your capacity. So I avoid the subject. But those who are students and those who are who are treading the path, there's no harm. I will teach them. For bandhas are involved in it. And there are mainly three locks. When Jalandar Bandha is applied, when Uddhana Bandha is applied, <coughs> and Muhen Mula Bandha is applied, <coughs> what you teach your student? You teach, inhale, <coughs> and retain and exhale. The books say like that. Teachers don't teach that. Teachers say exhale first. First exhale, then inhale. That's it is different. Now you inhale and then retain and then exhale. But it is, these, are, these things are not meant in the books. They are not written in the books. So directly a student comes immediately, you teach him inhalation. Because there is so much impurity in the lungs, how come you don't have sense about it? So first you should learn to teach student exhalation, not inhalation. So the book says inhalation, puraka, kumbhaka, and it has become the experience. Yogis will never write like that. In fact, what has happened, those who are very experienced, they did not have time to write. There are only few books written by those who were experienced, yet they had time to write or they had students who noted down, jotted down their notes and then published. Most of the books on yoga, philosophy and religion, history are just mess. They create confusion. There is no clarity. You can easily find out somebody who is realized and somebody who is not realized. Therefore, scriptures does not mean books. Scriptures have category. This subject you should practice in front of your teacher or come to see teacher wherever you find or understand what he says. Don't interpret in a different way. Don't translate it in your own way. It, should, it is not allowed. Again, I repeat first, you sit down, learn to attain a steady and comfortable posture. First, you come across with the tremors, because you are trying to discipline your body, which was never disciplined. The body will move one way or the other. It has nothing to do with Kundalini. Yeah. I've seen many people smoke marijuana, take drugs and start doing this and this. they say it's a Kundalini awakening. I was asked to speak in a group where everybody was doing like this. I told their teacher, what are they doing? So their Kundalini is awakened. I said, if they are, it is awakened, why do I speak to? <laughs> to whom? So I started walking in and I not do it. I said, if they stop, then I'll stop. They, everybody stopped. 
nowhere in any shastra it is mentioned no teacher will ever be foolish to teach his student doing like this and then call it kundalini awakening you sit down naturally your bottom will get warm naturally my bottom is warm so i kundalini <laughs> Okay, now children, joke is over. Be serious. <laughs> <laughs> so that was quite funny. Well, as he said and explained, um, these uh, scriptures were earlier only available. to the oral tradition to they were handed down from the teacher to the students when they were available at all and they were always kept covered and they were forbidden for anybody else we would never give or share these scriptures you were not allowed to read these scriptures if you were not a part of that lineage or that tradition and if you were not initiated into that practice so they were only given to that student when that student was ready however it has become common practice to put all sorts of things in books and the more advanced it is the more better it is the more complicated it is the better it is in fact it is not it has created a great deal of trouble it has created a great deal of problems and has harmed students because it has disturbed the pranic vehicle so we go to the next aspect which is what is the criteria for optimal breathing there are two things that you require to breathe normally in the most appropriate manner when i say optimal it means we expend a certain amount of energy to breathe in and out that itself takes a certain energy if our breathing is very hectic very agitated is not rhythmic then we are actually expending more energy than we are getting out of that breath so optimal breathing is when we use the diaphragm and when the breath is even when i mean even i mean the inhalation and the exhalation are more or less the same in length it means the amount of time you breathe in is equal to the amount of time you breathe out that that's even breathing and diaphragmatic breathing is the use of the diaphragm in the body for the breath for the breathing there are different kinds of breathing and so we will first try to understand them very shortly what are the different kinds of breathing on that first website you will find this um, under essential practices there's diaphragmatic breathing and this explains actually in fair amount of detail what diaphragmatic breathing is i've tried to keep it very simple not make it too scientific and not make it too um you know um difficult with with all the medical jargon but it suffices to know that the the entire torso has three aspects there's the chest which houses the lungs actually the chest the diaphragm which is below the chest and then the pelvis right 
Your lungs can be filled up in three ways. By expanding, extending the diaphragm downward, which is called diaphragmatic breathing. By expanding the, the walls of the chest outward, which is called chest breathing or thoracic breathing. And moving the shoulder area upward, which is called clavicular breathing. Clavicular breathing, the last one is when you move your shoulders upwards, up and down. That is the most shallow form of breathing, the most inefficient form of breathing. Chest breathing or thoracic breathing, when your chest moves in and out, that is the most common form of breathing, but not the most optimal form of breathing. To come back to what Ashish mentioned earlier, talked about running, you'll find a lot of athletes, a lot of people who run, who work out, for example, into modern bodybuilding or sports, they tend to do chest breathing. And this is because in our modern sedentary lives or also in our modern active lives, we wear a lot of tight clothes, you know, tight jeans, tight tops, even the shirts that people wear these days, even men wear very tight clothes. And these clothes, however fashionable they may look, they are not exactly very good for breathing. If you observe a baby, you will see that the baby's abdomen moves. Very emphatic movement, very clear movement. The abdomen moves up and down. Because the babies who don't have any stress as yet, very innocent, they are breathing naturally. We are not able to breathe naturally anymore because of our fashionable, tight clothing, because of stress that we experience, we are doing chest breathing. When do we start doing chest breathing? Normally, this is a very old, primitive kind of reaction. In the good old days, when primitive man went hunting or was surrounded by dangers, dangers such as um, to think of the man in the Stone Age, there would be a sable-toothed tiger and he would be hunting and then suddenly there was the sable-toothed tiger in front of him. What would he do? There are two reactions which are primitively imprinted in our mind, in our body, in our entire nervous system. And these are fight or flight. So either you fight against that tiger or you flee, you run away. For either of these two activities, your body needs to sum up a great deal of energy. In that case, the body needs to do diaphragmatic breathing, chest breathing, clavicular breathing, everything. Basically, give it the whole works. What has happened with modern man, modern lifestyle, is causing us to breathe like this all the time. It's chronic stress. What was a stress situation for the Stone Age man when he came in front of the sable to tiger? He was under stress and he reacted under a stress situation. But when he escaped from that sable to tiger or he killed it, stress was over. He went back to normal diaphragmatic breathing. But in our modern lifestyle, we don't go back to normal diaphragmatic breathing. We are under continuous stress. And because of this continuous stress, answering emails, taking phone calls, making presentations, um, attending meetings, taking care of the kids, dropping the kids to school, preparing meals, cleaning the house, a whole number of tasks which never seem to end. And we go from one situation to the other continuously under stress. Over a period of time, the body learns pure chest breathing and the diaphragm is no longer used. And this chest breathing is then so firmly imprinted that, that you unlearn the natural breathing altogether and you're doing chest breathing or clavicular breathing all the time, which is very inefficient, very harmful, because as we discussed earlier, 
The breath is a handle which also affects the mind. So if you're continuously under stress, imagine what happens to the mind. What is the state of mind you have? So we need to unlearn this. We need to unlearn this at the mental level as well as at the level of the breath. Purely at a physical level here, we need to establish normal diaphragmatic breathing as our normal breathing pattern. And so Scott, to come back to your question about what I refer to as normal diaphragmatic breathing is this, that your body unlearns chest breathing or clavicular breathing and establishes itself in diaphragmatic breathing. Most of you are possibly doing chest breathing. You're not allowing your breath to be full, complete and natural. And of all these three breaths, kinds of breathing, diaphragmatic breathing is physiologically the most efficient. It's the most natural breathing pattern and this is what needs to be established. So what is natural breathing? Diaphragmatic breathing is all inhalation and exhalation will flow through the nostril, not through the mouth, and the entire process is silent and noiseless and smooth. So when you establish even diaphragmatic breathing, you allow your lungs to expand fully and naturally. We don't need to go into the details of how the diaphragmatic breathing works, but you can find out if you are breathing correctly. And you can do that right now by simply putting your hand on your chest. If you put one hand on your chest, you can put one hand on your abdomen and breathe normally. If you're breathing diaphragmatically, then it's your hand which is on your abdomen which will rise and fall. And the hand on the chest will not. If you're breathing from the, using the chest muscles, doing thoracic breathing, then you will find your chest is rising up and down and not your abdomen. Yes, Aranka, sometimes they both are moving and that's because you, perhaps you have been practicing some, uh, a little bit of uh, diaphragmatic breathing, uh, using the practices of Makarasan or, or something and you have become more aware. It means that you need to further strengthen the diaphragm and over a period of time, Unlearn, become more conscious of the fact that in moments of stress, you need to check. You can run this check anytime. Run this check anytime. Sometimes if you are traveling in the train, you know, you're not very busy. You're not driving yourself. Just check your breath. You know, if you are waiting somewhere for somebody in that, in, you know, for a dentist appointment or, or you're just sitting in a cafe, you can check your breath just anytime in between. And you will notice that if you are using chest breathing, you become over a period of time more aware of your breath. And then try to consciously keep your hand on the abdomen and strengthen the abdominal breathing or, or diaphragmatic breathing. So this is a very important test if you're breathing right. Okay, it's, it's a very simple but don't underestimate this. It sounds almost simplistic and one can 
One tends to dismiss this perhaps as something childish or too simple for me. But it's absolutely the foundation, absolute basic. Now, if you have an established diaphragmatic breathing and you start doing other breathing exercises, to come back to the example of two to one breathing, now you have an established diaphragmatic breathing, you're breathing partly through the chest and you're breathing partly maybe also clavicular and a bit diaphragm, you know, all mixed up. And then you are doing two to one breathing. This is not very effective. So we get back to scratch, get back to the basics and spend far more time establishing the diaphragmatic breath. You don't need to establish your two to one breathing right now. You need to focus first on establishing diaphragmatic breathing. You need to become like a baby again. You know, go back to that state of innocence natural breath, natural spontaneous breathing. Abdominal breathing and diaphragmatic breathing is not exactly the same. Sometimes one uses the motion of the abdomen just in and out, but it is not necessarily adding anything to the breath. The diaphragm is a muscle directly beneath your ribs. It is in fact the largest muscle in the entire body. It's the most powerful muscle in the entire body. And it is very sad that most of us don't use the most powerful muscle in the entire body. This is why in martial arts, they put a great deal of emphasis here on the stomach area. You know, in martial arts, you may have seen, those of you who may have seen martial art movies or, or maybe have uh, some friends who do it or are doing it yourself, that a great deal of emphasis is, is maintained on that shout, you know, they, when they strike, they have a, uh, they shout. And that exhalation, that's a kind of an exhalation which comes through the stomach area. And that stomach area is basically this diaphragm, which is a muscle between the chest and the abdomen. And when this Diaphragm is strengthened, it's a muscle, so it has to be strengthened like you strengthen any other muscle. Imagine you are lifting weights, you know, you want to strengthen your biceps, you want big arms, like a lot of men aspire to have big biceps, you know, big arms, uh, bulging muscles, they impress women with that. <laughs> well, how did they get that? By weightlifting, they get stronger. So you can use weights to strengthen that muscle. How do you do that? You know, you can't take dumbbells and, and, and use them. So how do you do that? Well, one of the simplest ways is using the weight of your own body. So when you lie in this position in Makarasan, in the crocodile pose, your legs apart slightly, your chest slightly lifted, resting your head on, resting your head on the arms. Then you see that your weight, your entire body weight, your torso weight, is actually resting on your diaphragm. And in order to breathe in this position, you have to lift the diaphragm has to lift your entire body weight. So it's basically weightlifting. So that's the position how it looks from aerially. Legs apart, head downwards, resting on the arms, and the weight is resting on the diaphragm. It's resting on that area between the abdomen and the chest. You will also feel it, of course, slightly on the abdomen and you will, you will feel your abdomen also rising and falling. You will have to do it in order to be able to breathe. If you do this technique just for 5 to 10 minutes, twice a day, morning and evening, it can help 
make diaphragmatic breathing a habit. And once you are able to establish or maintain diaphragmatic breathing through the day, during the day, it will become normal even when you're upright, even in your normal day-to-day -day life. You will see how much more relaxed you are, how much you, you will feel at ease. Okay? That's one, to do it using Makarasan. The other is in Shavasan, in the corpse position, you lie on the floor and you just put your hand on the chest. It's the same thing what here is, is depicted in the sitting position. You do the same in lying down position. You keep one hand on your chest, one hand on your diaphragm. You see the hand is not on the abdomen, but it's on the lower part of the chest. It's between the abdomen and the chest. So you do that in lying down position and you feel your abdomen or your chest, sorry, not, not your chest, you feel your abdomen rising and falling. And that, as you observe it, it will also strengthen them, the diaphragmatic breathing. And why this? This is an alternative because you find this posture, Makarasan, you will not be able to do more than five, maximum ten minutes. It's quite exhausting. Your diaphragm is lifting the weight of your entire torso. It's quite exhausting. But it is the strongest, strongest muscle in your body, so it can do it. It can do that. So don't be worried. This is a totally safe practice. Absolutely nothing can go wrong here. There's no harm. And you can do it for 5 to 10 minutes. Shavasana as well. If you tire of Makarasana, if you tire of doing this weight lifting, then you can do it lying on your back. It's very comfortable and you can do that. Another method is of putting uh, a slight weight on your diaphragm. You can take a blanket, a folded blanket, and put a folded blanket on your diaphragm. If you have a, a longish pillow or, or something like that, you can also put that on your diaphragm in Shavasan in the lying down position and lift that weight. You know, it's, it's like weight lifting. In some of the uh, Himalayan institutes of uh, in India as well as in the US, in Honesdale, for example, they have sandbags. So they have these kind of very flexible, flexibly constructed sandbags. So they have a lot of weight and they put it on the diaphragm and then you do this weight lifting with the sandbag. <laughs> so that's really weight lifting. But, you know, you don't need to go and get yourself a sandbag. They're not available. You actually have to make it yourself. If you don't want to do that, you simply do makara. So no, you can just fold a blanket and use that. So... This is about a diaphragm and diaphragmatic breathing and meditation is very important. We will go into the details of that in our next session. I think this is a good place to stop. In the next sessions, we will also cover um how we can do different pranayams the postures to sit in what is the criteria what's the best posture for you etc so we will cover that in the following sessions and um just to give you a preview if you want there are the book the forthcoming book as i mentioned the online sessions are based on the book which will be published sometime end of this year, I think. And it is covering about 13 chapters. So, and we'll cover advanced pranayam as well. And so next sessions, 
we will go ahead with postures, some basic mudras, etc. Okay, so that was for pranayam, and Matthias had a question on sadhaka, sadhu, and adhikari. I will just shortly answer that for Matthias. Uh, the others, if you're interested, you can stay on or you can drop out. But sadhaka is a seeker. You are a sadhaka, Matthias. Everybody who is practicing a seeker is a sadhaka. It comes from the word sadhana. If you do sadhana, if you practice, you are a sadhaka. Sadhu, on the other hand, is somebody who lives, who, who gives up everything, he renounces everything and he lives on the streets. He can do this for a short while or for a lifetime. It's not, it's not a lifetime's oath. He is not part of any tradition. He doesn't have to be a part of any order. He doesn't have to be part of any school. You can become a sadhu if you just give up everything and walk around on the streets and beg for your living, then you are a sadhu. An adhikari is a qualified student Anybody can be a sadhaka, but Adhikari is the highly qualified student. Only he can attain the highest. Okay? Now that's the difference between the three. They are not the same. They have three different uh, meanings. Okay, so everybody, thank you very much. Have a nice um, rest of your Sunday. <laughs> Svarnalata, good night or good morning to you. And... Uh, See you all next Sunday. Those of you who are joining again, we will see you on Friday for Bhagavad Gita or we see you, of course, on Sunday. So, bye-bye, everybody. Namaste. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Radhika Bye. Bye, Katna. Bye, Aparna. Happy Divine Mother Day. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much, Radhika. Goodbye. Goodbye, Yuka. Goodbye, Scott. Goodbye, Patricia. Rastaji? Yes. Um, I have one doubt. Yeah, sure. Is, uh, during abdomen, abdomen breathing, can you explain that one more time? In yes. Laying in Shavasana? Yeah, who, sure, but who is speaking because I don't see who is speaking? Hema, Hema Shri. Hema, Hema Okay, for some reason it doesn't show the speaker. Yeah, tell me Hema. Okay. Uh, I have doubts in Shavasana, uh, that is abdomen breathing, like yeah. in Shavasana. Yeah. Uh, can you explain that? Because I'm trying from the basics, so... Okay. Uh, I try keep keeping my hand on my chest and yeah. one on my abdomen. Can yeah. you explain that because I missed that part? Yeah, okay, I mean, basically, you know Shavasana, you just lie in Shavasana. And when you are lying in Shavasana, one hand you keep in the chest, and the other okay. on the ab abdomen or b above the abdomen, you know, on the chest area. And then yes. you will notice that either both are rising or only one. Okay. If your chest is rising, that means you're doing chest breathing. If your abdomen is rising, you're doing abdominal breathing. If both are rising, it means you're doing a combination of both. Okay? Okay. And what okay. we want to achieve is abdominal breathing. That only the hand on your abdomen rises and falls. Okay? Okay. 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 All right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Because I have a doubt. I thought the diaphragm should uh, rise up and down. Yeah. Abdomen should not rise up and down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, abdomen will naturally rise up and down, but you know you don't force it to rise and up and down in the sense of inflating it. You know that's not the purpose. Oh, okay. No, no. You can also inflate it, but that does not come from the abdo uh, diaphragm. Then, when you use your diaphragm, your abdomen will naturally move out. But you can also and move your abdomen out, and we don't want to move the abdomen out. We actually want to move the diaphragm. Oh. Yeah, keep practicing a little bit. You know, when you do it a little longer, you will get a feel for it. Yeah. We can revisit and this what? again later, you know, at some other time. Sure. When you have practiced sure. a little bit, then we can revisit it. Yeah. Then you have a, you'll have a different understanding then. Okay? Sure. 
leave mm-hmm. but when i breathe out yeah. when i completely breathe out i mm-hmm. could feel that uh, abdomen is contracting all the muscles outside so that is something common is it normal yeah if you completely breathe out it does not necessarily mean um, that you're doing diaphragmatic breathing in a normal state what it means is that you are using all three then because you may be exerting yourself and that's not the idea again in diaphragmatic breathing okay okay so uh, it should only come from diaphragm yes i should not exhale completely through abdomen. yes yes in the beginning we must establish diaphragmatic breathing this complete exhalation that's another practice okay that's a completely different practice and that one does much later and that one does only for a shorter period of time and the purpose of that is to remove toxins yes okay yes, yes. and so that's a different practice okay. first we need to establish diaphragmatic breathing without this we cannot even go forward okay one so should, should not completely exhale out completely exhale, out, com- uh, completely exhale uh, exhale yeah. while breathing no you just okay. need to have a normal breath just as you normal. normally breathe okay, okay. normal okay. breath okay. this is where i make Okay. Yes. Thank yes. you. Thank yes. you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So the meeting is over, and I think Krishna, you just join in, or what happened there? You. Okay. Good. So we end here, unless somebody else has anything to clarify. So, goodbye, all. Thank mm-hmm. you.